Hello, my name is Kristen Talbot and I am the program coordinator for the Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today. And thank you to our friends at El Rio for hosting today's se session on pediatric GI with Dr. Moran. Dr. Christopher Moran is an attending physician who treats patients in the Mass General Hospital for Ch Children Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition Unit and the Mass General Hospital for Children Pediatric Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center. He is the director of the Pediatric GI Fellowship Program at Mass General Hospital for Children and has previously been the co-director of the Fellow Mentoring Program of NASPGAAN. <laughs> His research interests focus on the genetics of very early onset inflammatory bowel disease and using genetic testing to better understand IBD and develop more targeted therapies for patients. As part of the MGHFC Pediatric IBD program, he frequently attends the MGHFC Pediatric IBD Parent Patient Advisory Team events and has been very kind to do our presentation today. Dr. Maria, when you're ready, um, please start. Right. Well, thank you for the kind introduction and the invitation to talk. Let me find my share slides area. All right. Can people see the slides? Yes. Fair. Thank you. It shouldn't, I, I realize like by now with Zoom, we should know how to share slides, but like it still seems like a struggle. Um, so sorry about that. So I was going to talk about ab abdominal pain. Different, different types of cases. I'm happy to stop at any point and, and kind of go on interesting tangents if people are interested in that. Um, I don't think the slides will probably take the full hour. Um, and I was trying to look at this, you know, as a GI doctor, I, I have, it's a biased view, right? That like, I'm seeing a lot of patients that come into the office and that is probably not representative of everything that you are seeing in clinic, in ERs, that, that there's a group of people probably, it's a different population where some people don't have enough symptoms necessarily that want to come to GI or even want to have an intervention. But I did try to aim for the greater population of, they're not necessarily even in GI clinic, but like they're coming in to say, see one of you um, in clinic in, a, in that kind of a setting instead. Let me get my slides here. All right, here is the definition of the disclosure by the FDA and the concept paper, um, and that UCLA fully endorses the letter in the spirit of, of those concepts. I don't have any disclosure, any relevant disclosures to share with you today. Um, this is the accreditation slide. I hopefully have done those slides adequately. Um, so just talking about like cases. So I, I figured, you know, the maybe one of the more straightforward cases and common cases that happens would be like a teenager that just comes in for their well check actually and you know that you go through all of the different things that are you know different types of social history interactions like risky behaviors advising and then toward the end of the visit they say oh by the way and then this is it it, it, it at least develops into something um you know, having, I, I've been having crampy belly pain, let's say for the last six months, off and on, maybe not a clear pattern, maybe associated with some dairy, you know, you look at the growth curve, the growth curve looks totally fine. The exam that you've already done is pretty normal. Maybe the bowel sounds are a little bit more hyperactive than the, like the next person and, the, and the, the last person that you just examined. But overall, this is a, like a 13 year old male that looks fine maybe not a lot of family history to go off of, like to point in a particular direction, but they say that there's, you know, some, some symptoms with dairy, which I feel like is a common thing. And I think it is, sometimes it's tough because when you don't have that very convincing story that like, oh, it always happens with dairy, um, then is, is it just like a little bit like the nugget where the idea has been put into their head because they've done a Google search and heard about lactose intolerance and if it, maybe it does happen with dairy, I have a lot of dairy so, and it happens a lot. So maybe it's dairy. Um, maybe somebody else has already planted that seed in their head. Maybe they've even tried to cut back a little bit and haven't seen a difference or have seen a difference. Um, but at least when, when I'm, I, when I'm thinking like in this situation, you know, I think it, it, especially if it wasn't really what brought them into, the, into clinic or in for care and you know, there's no, no, there's no red flags at all. You've got kind of 
time to be dealing with it. You know, the most. Now, she reasonable did not. Um, she is not married, is she? Okay. I'm sorry. Someone Renee, in that group got married, though, right? Renee, you're not mm -hmm. muted. What of you? Uh, the 13 year old is not married. I should, I, I, I'm happy to also share. Um, but the, yeah, so, so what do we do um, in that situation? I mean, I think lactose intolerance is a totally reasonable thing. Um, you know, it's a really common problem. You know, I tell people it's like two thirds, three quarters of the world are lactose intolerant. And it, it, it does seem like there are genetic polymorphisms that increase. That, that that show different like lead to different rates of lactose intolerance across the world. I, but I think it's it's relevant to be thinking about like anybody could be lactose intolerant for a number of different reasons. You know, we know that as adults, you progressively get more lactose intolerance. You know, for a 13 year old in this case, it's totally reasonable to think like we may be developing adult onset lactose intolerance. And in that situation, you know, it, it's a genetically programmed you just make less of that lactase enzyme that is seen that that found in the upper small bowel, and it's not usually something that happens immediately. But maybe they start complaining about it immediately. Um, it is, you know, we classically you think about it happening, you know, 30 minutes to a couple of hours after having a large load of lactose, you know, and there's a variety of symptoms. You know, we typically will think about bloating, belly pain. Um, diarrhea, although sometimes there may be constipation. I think, you know, it's the data would say about 10% of people with lactose intolerance are, con are constipated. Um, those definitely you kind of lose out on the close time relationship um, between constipation and lactose intolerance. But it, it, it's a reasonable thing to be thinking about no matter what. And, and some people just have this feeling of like unwellness, dizziness, um, with a variety of just systemic symptoms also. And, and I think what I struggle with as a GI doctor, th there's a variety of different ways of testing people for lactose intolerance. Probably the, I'll admit, uh, to, to skip the top two things, the top two bullets, the third bullet is actually what, probably what I do the most. That like, if somebody comes in and says, I just feel like I'm having these symptoms, maybe there's an association when I have dairy, you know, I take lactose out of the diet. Like, I don't know that you necessarily need to test to fully define lactose intolerance, and that there's not as much, there's not a value to like the, you know, some of the other results that you can get with these tests. So I'll, I'll say, take lactose out of the diet entirely for like a week, and you know, clearly there are ways to like supplement people that are lactose intolerant with the enzyme. That I would actually say like forget about the en forget about like using lactase enzyme supplements because you're not going to totally know. It won't be necessarily as convincing of improvement. It, usually, my rant is, you know, it's hard to totally know if you're gonna have if you're gonna have ice cream, how, ma how many lactase enzyme supplement pills do you need to take? Is it one? Is it two? Is it five? So, like, let's not spend a week where it, we still don't totally know what the reaction is. Let's just take let's just take lactose totally out of the diet for a week. If we are convincingly better, then that really like I, that would cinch me to say, if, if you're great off of lactose. This really does seem like lactose intolerance. Now let's start adding it back in little by little to see how much you can tolerate. Um, in my experience, it kind of depends on the teenager for how eager they are to like give up ice cream, give up different, like cream cheese on their bagel. Um, a lactose breath test is a reasonable thing, although it is not necessarily like perfect. Um, the sensitivity as I've got up there is like not 100%. Um, so I think somebody that comes, like somebody that comes into my office and says, like, I think I'm lactose intolerant, and I have the test to prove it's lactose intolerance. You know, but every time I have lactose, I feel crummy. Like I don't know that we need a test to convince you not to not to feel crummy. Um, I, you know, the, the reason why the sensitivity isn't perfect is because one, most most commercially available lactose breath tests are not testing for both hydrogen and methane. So there are some people that where their bacteria as they as they break down as the bacteria break down the lactose that you have not digested, they produce methane and we're just not capturing that as a positive test. The other thing is that like with antibiotic use that can temporarily kind of suppress the amount of bacteria in the large intestine. So you may get negative breath tests because like you just don't have, you, you have temporarily altered the bacterial balance. So like lactose breath tests are available. I don't, I can't say that I use them all that often, um, but I use them. 
Um, the other and clearly more aggressive invasive way is to actually, during an endoscopy, take a biopsy and actually measure the lactase enzyme. You know, that is probably only like worthwhile to do if you're looking for other things. Like I don't do an endoscopy looking for lactose intolerance. If I'm doing an endoscopy for other reasons and I'm worried about lactose intolerance, that's probably where that role comes in. Um, and admittedly, there is an older school fourth way to deal with this with a lactose tolerance test, kind of similar to a glucose tolerance test, where it's all done by blood work uh, on a kind of a repeated basis where you drink a large amount of lactose and then you're measuring glucose levels over the course of, of two hours, expecting that if you are not lactose intolerant, like if you absorb the lactose, you'll see a big spike in glucose. And if you're lactose intolerant, then then you're not going to absorb as much lactose, so you don't see the spikes in glucose. Nobody does like nobody does that anymore. At least at least in our group, nobody's doing that now, just because like serial blood work in somebody doesn't seem like a fun experience, especially if there's other ways of navigating. But like, admittedly, like I I'm happy to rest on a diagnosis of lactose intolerance if you really do get better taking lactose out of the diet and then even coming back with a challenge and you start having symptoms. If it really fixes your symptoms, then I think you probably already have your diagnosis. You know, and, and how much, like when you're lactose intolerant, you don't, you don't have to avoid it entirely. You can use the lactase enzyme supplements to um, try to raise your thresholds. I mean, I, I just think of it as like, everybody has a threshold of how much lactose they can handle. Um, and, the la and the lactase supplements just kind of increase so, they, so that way it's a little bit more tolerant. You know, I think, you know, there's studies in adults showing a, a typical adult who's lactose intolerant probably can handle almost a full glass of milk, um, sip, like taken slowly over the course of a couple of hours, but it's really more like the heavier loads um, or the repeated loads that eventually add up to start developing symptoms with the idea that you're just kind of overwhelming the body's ability to digest the lactose. And then as a result of you not digesting lactose, then the bacteria in the intestines chew it up into more disgusting things to give you symptoms. Um, you know, the idea of like fattier meals might actually also help with, with lactose intolerance and like yogurts are typically better tolerated because there's a fat content to it. So it just kind of slows how often, how fast the lactose drips out of the, out of the stomach to give the small intestine its fair shot at digesting the lactose. And I think the other thing that as a GI doctor, we always think about, and that's, that's why I want to hear back from families actually they've taken out the lactose is there's other things that cause lactose intolerance. You know, clearly viral gastroenteritis can give you a temporary lactose intolerance. Um, the, there are people with celiac disease that will often present with lactose intolerance. And I feel like there's, for some reason, there's, been, I, I've seen a, a, an increased rate of like people coming in saying, I've been lactose intolerant for like years, but like even cutting out the lactose, I still have the symptoms now. And ultimately those people are found to have celiac disease. Um, so it, it is, you know, that's, I feel like the, probably a much more common thing to be watching out for that if someone's struggling and they really are lactose, like they're keeping themselves totally off of lactose for that week and they're not feeling better, celiac disease, I feel like should come to, come to the mind. Crohn's disease, probably to a lesser extent where Crohn's disease probably hides a little bit less, at least, or masquerading like lactose intolerance, but it certainly can. Um, Commonly, celiac and Crohn's disease both would cause some weight loss. Um, Crohn's disease potentially could cause blood in the stool, but like not, oh, like not 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 at 100% rate. So like, I would definitely say like that relatively healthy teenager with the crampy belly pain that gets a little better with lactose restriction. I would wonder could they have celiac could they have celiac disease? With the idea being, but really for any inflammatory condition, like underneath the underneath the microscope, the villi that we have in the small intestine. You know, when those get inflamed, like when those get inflamed, the villi get stubbier and almost sometimes gone. And that doesn't matter whether it's celiac disease or a viral gastro. Um, but with the idea that like where the enzyme, where the ends, the lactase enzyme is, is at the tips of the villi. And if you have like injured villi or almost like gone a totally flat gut, you just don't have as much of that um, enzyme. And I think that's the thing to be kind of watching out. And I would also consider IBS that like, in a, you know, and it, sometimes it may be lactose intolerance driving some of the, some of the bloating and some of the diarrhea in addition to IBS kind of manifesting and kind of increasing symptoms. So celiac disease, I really would say like, if you're having any symptoms, 
of, from the GI tract, it could be celiac disease. And, and that is even like, you know, getting away from the lactose intolerance standpoint. You know, we've seen like kids graduate high school, head off to college, drop 15 pounds in college and with the worries about an eating disorder and when they are describing relatively good intakes um, and then ter them turning out to have celiac disease. So like it is, it, it's hard to come into a GI clinic, I feel like, without someone thinking about sending off celiac strain because it really could be any GI symptom or even admittedly the absence of symptoms, it, the absence of GI symptoms with like headaches, fatigue, like all of those things are also reasonable to wonder, um, could, those be, could that be celiac disease? And from a, like a celiac disease standpoint, I would say if you're going to send off a celiac screen, you know, the most important things are both the, t the tissue transglutaminase IgA or the TTG IgA and then a total IgA. And the reason we send off the total IgA is more from like a quality control check that if you are IgA deficient and there is a higher rate of people is almost three to five percent in some studies of, of patients with celiac disease also have IgA deficiency with the idea that if you don't make enough of the of, of immunoglobulin A anyhow, you may not be able to make a specific IgA. So we all, like we we oftentimes will kind of default to um, do, sending off the TTG IgG in the setting of IgA deficiency. And usually, when we're thinking about like a, a, a IgA level that is too low to really um, to what is too low where we can't totally trust the t uh, like a, a traditional celiac strain? We usually say it needs to be in the single digit. So like somebody whose total IG level is just like a little bit below the normal range, that's probably fine. I would say somebody like, and that usually winds up being, it's kind of age dependent, but I usually think of like 50 or 60 is oftentimes like the lower limit of the, what the lab describes. But we're, we're, we're really saying like, if, if the total IG is less than 10, that's when we start not trusting a, a TTG IgA. Um, so it's always worthwhile sending off if like if we're having any hints of like something beyond lactose intolerance. Um, and then just kind of on the idea of like other kinds of allergies or food intolerances, you know, I think you clearly eosinophilic GI disease where you're having these eosinophils in the in the lining of the intestinal tract, it exists, you know, EOE or eosinophilic esophagitis is becoming more common. That wouldn't cause cramping. Um, that would be usually more like esophageal symptoms and oftentimes like food getting stuck um, either temporarily or, or permanently and them having to kind of regurgitate it back up or nausea. Um, most of the other eosinophilic GI diseases are much rarer. Um, and what we've come to find is that like the, food, like the, the IgE or IgG based food panels are not that predictive. Um, the when we think about like with GI symptoms, you know, debating is it a food allergy or is it an intolerance? You know, the way I would define it, the, the difference being a food allergy is driven by the immune system in some way versus the food intolerances traditionally are not thought to be um, driven by the immune system. And, you know, that's it does get to like a little bit of a vague area, but I feel like most GI symptoms that are due to foods are probably more of an intolerance and probably more like you know, a weird digestion of, by the, by the microbiome, by the bacteria in the intestine. And it's not necessarily the person's immune system that's interacting poorly with the foods, but it's actually their microbiome. Um, and, you know, the, we don't have a lot of good blood tests or skin tests to look for food, for food intolerances. The reality is, you know, it, while it is easy to send off IgE levels to a particular food where people get symptoms, it's not that predictive. Um, and I think there's growing data coming out showing that like there may be some harm to these broad panels or even targeted panels of sending off an IG level to a food that you feel crummy with. And then you may like, I tell patients in clinic that like it may take us down the wrong path, like a mildly positive wheat IGE and then taking gluten out of the diet, you know, probably it, it, it muddies the picture a little bit and it's not that predictive of actually having an issue with, with, with the wheat. And probably more so, it, 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 we may get reassured by foods that are that have IgE levels that are negative. So, like we will frequently see, like people with milk IgE levels be negative, but clearly have lactose intolerance. People say, "I already have the blood test for, for lactose intolerance. Fine." It's not like it's you really have the the blood test looking for 
an app like a immune driven allergy to milk, but not lactose intolerance, which is a totally different beast. Um, I think I think that I'm happy to take any questions about that. I feel like I was we, we covered a couple of different things. I'm happy to take challenges to my rants. I am happy to expand upon anything. So if you have any questions, you can just unmute yourself and talk directly to uh, Dr. Moran. If you're uncomfortable doing that, you can type it into the chat box and I will read it to him. Can you go a little bit more into the celiac um, testing? Yeah, I mean, so so the celiac, blood, like, so it's interesting because like the antibodies that we have progressively discovered looking for celiac disease, there, I explain to parents and patients that like, these are not causing the disease. That like somebody would still, like it, it's not a perfect, like everybody with celiac disease has these antibodies, their they, celiac disease is defined by these antibodies. I more think of it as a relatively weird reaction to the damage that happens with celiac disease. So like, that's why the sensitivity is not 100%. So like there's a decent number of like five to ten percent of people with celiac disease where their antibody all their antibodies are negative. They have every other part of celiac disease. They respond to a gluten free diet. And the best way I look at it is if, if for somebody with celiac disease, if if I could give them a medication to just specifically get rid of these antibodies, they still have celiac. They, like they still would have celiac disease if they were eating gluten. Um, it is it, it it's few and far between the serology negative patients. So like, you know, if, when I think of it as like, if one in every hundred, if one, one in every 125 people has celiac disease and it's about 10% or 5% lack the antibodies, then we're talking more like one in every 1,250 people have serology negative celiac disease. So I think it's relatively reassuring if you have negative celiac screen. Um, you know, the, the TTG IGA is probably, and, and the total IGA, that's what I send off. For, for most patients. And like the, the anti-endomesial antibody typically incurs a higher cost. You know, it, it doesn't add that much more. It does seem a little bit less sensitive. Um, so we've largely kind of backed away from it. And, you know, 10 years ago, I think we were sending off both of these antibodies along with the total IgA. And now we've really backed away unless it's a complex, unless it's a complicated patient that we're trying to like figure out, does this really seem like celiac disease? The, the anti-glidin antibodies, the, those are more of the, like, those have been around for longer. The sensitivity is certainly lower, more like 70%, and the, probably the specificity is also down around there. So it's less, it's much less helpful. So I think we try to hold off on at least sending off the anti-glidin antibodies um, because they're, they're less helpful. Um, there's a little bit of data arguing for the anti gamma glidin peptide or DGP IgA versus IgG to maybe capture a little bit more of the patients with the patients with celiac disease that may not have a positive TTG. Um, I haven't totally bought into that yet. I, I, I feel like it is it it's not as helpful as we'd like it to be. But I, I would say like anybody with GI symptoms. Again, coming from a skewed, I'm in a GI clinic where someone's coming in with, like, someone has made the decision in the morning to say, I really need to go see a gastroenterologist. Like, I would say anybody in that situation, I would definitely get a celiac screen. Um, and anybody that, like, is having symptoms going on for more than six months, I, I think, I think we probably undertest celiac disease. And it's interesting to look at, like, the number of patients that are diagnosed with celiac disease in the country versus, like, some of the... Like when people have looked at blood bank, like blood bank rates of having a positive TTG, it's far it's it's far higher than the, the overall number of patients that are currently diagnosed with celiac. So I think in this in this country we miss out on a lot of people with celiac disease. As a pediatric GI doc, my 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 bias is I think in pediatrics we probably do a lot of it. In adult medicine, I don't know I I don't know that adult gastroenterologists think about it quite as often. And I think it is even even after we've diagnosed the kid. With celiac disease, oftentimes it's the parents that are having celiac disease symptoms may find a little hard time getting someone to send off a celiac screen. I was gonna ask you kind of like the opposite of what you're talking about with the kids being diagnosed and then the parents being tested. What about patients who maybe don't have a lot of symptoms but have a strong family history of celiac? Yeah, 
Yes. So the so the guideline, so the pediatric GI guidelines would be that if you have a first degree family member, you have bought yourself into the high risk club, and every few years you should probably get screened, with or and that is with or without symptoms. So like, and and oftentimes like knowing that celiac disease has a variety of different like symptoms, including like fatigue, and like I've I have pulled in some very reluctant siblings who are upset that are upset that their brother or sister ha was diagnosed with celiac disease and now they have to get a blood test and talk to me because like they're fine but they have a positive celiac screen why on earth would they want to get screened um and, or why often why, why on earth do they need to take gluten out and i think it, it is i think we we also underestimate like some of these symptoms that like you know when i ask the teenager in that situation like are you fatigued like i mean how many of us right now are like everybody's fatigued and like you may not totally get a good sense for like how severe is the fatigue until you don't feel fatigued anymore and i like some of those patients over the years that have really stood out to me that like the really reluctant ones to go onto a gluten-free diet they feel so much better once we actually start treating their celiac disease that wasn't obviously causing symptoms but like it was causing fatigue it was causing a little bit of mental fogginess um parents are sometimes hard like it, it parents are sometimes harder to convince that like oh yes you should get screened even though you're not having symptoms, because you know there is, it probably is five to ten percent, a five to ten percent rate of if you have a first degree family member that you will ultimately develop celiac. So it's not a foregone conclusion that just because you've got a somebody that else, somebody that is like re closely related to you is going to have celiac. It, it it is a pretty high rate that you do you and even just like now if if I send off a blood test now for somebody like for a sibling or or a parent. Um, of somebody with celiac disease, a negative blood test now this isn't necessarily as predictive. It, it is not predictive of like where are we going to be in three years, five years, ten years down the road. Um, there's a little bit of debate, and when I when I said before, like the pediatric GI guidelines, you know, the U.S. guidelines, like non-GI guidelines for health screening, hasn't totally bought into the value of setting off a TTG um, for first degree family members, but the adult GI guidelines have started to embrace it and the pediatric GI guidelines have embraced it for a while. Um, so I definitely would recommend it because I think otherwise, like that, that explains some of that missing cohort of patients that have celiac but just haven't been like diagnosed with celiac disease yet. Um, the other part to it is that there's some growing interest and kind of like good sense to think about screening people a little bit more. So if you like, so one thing that we have found in celiac disease is that like the vast majority nearly 99 percent almost 100 percent of people with celiac disease have a, have one of two hla markers either either dq2 or dq8 and there is some like the pediatric again the pediatric gi guidelines are now starting to embrace the idea of a one-time screening for those hla markers because if they if it's negative then you kind of buy yourself out of the club that like it is really hard to explain somebody who lacks either DQ2 or DQ8 um, if you're missing both of those HLA markers. We think that that is necessary to develop celiac disease. So a one-time screening, while it is a little bit more expensive in that one like lab visit, it's probably long-term more like like more worthwhile than th every three years or every two years getting celiac screens for 80 years of your life. That answer the question. Yeah, and then since you were saying that, like um, these antibodies are sort of like the body's reaction to having celiac disease, does that mean that somebody who maybe like hasn't been exposed to a lot of gluten, if their family maybe has celiac and they don't cook with gluten, um, that these would be like a one of the negatives that just because they're not eating it? Yeah, I it, yes, um, yeah. So so if somebody say, you know, if the firstborn is diagnosed with celiac disease at five and the whole family decides we're going to go gluten-free the house is going to go gluten-free that like subsequent children that then start growing up in the gluten-free household and are not getting exposed you know you're kind of already like the expectation is you're kind of already treating the whole house and including like anybody else that is not diagnosed with celiac disease they're gonna they're gonna have they very very likely will have negative celiac screens I think as time gets on and as those kids get older, when they start eating out of the house, that's when the families have to decide, you know, 
when you go to school, do you have to eat gluten-free food? Because then that, that would be the time where I would start to screen people. Like I wouldn't necessarily screen like a two-year-old that doesn't eat out, like is eating in a fully gluten-free household. I can see the argument of like, we're already doing what we would be doing if, if, if that child had celiac disease. But once they start eating, like that's when I would say, like once they start getting exposed to the gluten, that's when I would start screening. And that, that's when symptoms and celiac disease may develop. Thank you. I was just curious if you see the screening of using the HLA markers becoming something that is going to be more mainstream or how far away we are from that. So, so it's right now really payer dependent, to be honest. That like there are some there are some like insurance plans that totally buy into the idea of yes, it's worthwhile because we can take it off the table. Like we we can basically exclude celiac exclude celiac disease in their lifespan. Um, some will, some some insurance companies are still kind of defining it as a non-justified expense. Um, it, it is oftentimes the, the HLA screens are costing about two hundred fifty to three hundred dollars, so that that can sometimes be relatively cost prohibitive um, for families, and especially since like you know, I, I think it's families are oftentimes pressed with like, well, is it is it worthwhile to spend two hundred fifty or three hundred dollars for your child? That like, I would say in those situations, if insurance isn't going to cover it, I would not send it right now because I actually do envision in the next five to ten years insurance is going to be paying it at, at, at better and better rates. So like, just because if we don't get it now, we should still screen you for celiac disease with a celiac screen. But then in three years from now, let's regroup and maybe your insurance company is now is now going to cover it. So it's it, it's not an it's not a insignificant cost to families if they have to pay for it out of pocket. Um, so I definitely would hold off. And the reality is, you know, the, these two HLA markers are found in about 30% of America. So it's not, it, it, is, it does not mean you're going to get celiac disease. Definitively. It probably does increase the likelihood a little bit, just because, you know, it, there are, once we know that you, if I pick somebody out randomly on the street and say, I, I don't know what their H, I don't know what their HLA markers, I still say that they probably have like a one in 125 chance of developing celiac disease. If I know that they have one of the risk genes, it does increase the chance. It doesn't increase to like 50-50. It may like depending on, you know, if you've got two copies of DQ2, it probably increases it to like a 8% chance, but that's still pretty small. So like I would definitely say that like waiting until insurance covers it is totally is is definitely worthwhile. Um because the reality is it, it's not necessarily like the action that we take, you know, with every test, I feel like. You ought to have something you're going to do with it. You know, if I if I'm seeing a five-year-old with a family history of celiac disease and they're asymptomatic, and we could either send off the celiac screen now, and then regroup in a couple of years when insurance pays for it, or we could send off the celiac screen now and the HLA markers now. And if the celiac screen is negative and the HLA markers are negative, we never have to think about celiac disease for them ever again. Um, but it's, I would say in the setting of like, if you're having symptoms, I have had the experience a couple of times of fighting it out with insurance to say, listen, mom and dad both have celiac disease, or mom, one of the parents has celiac disease and they're having a little bit of symptoms. It'd be better if we could do both and a long drawn out four month battle with insurance. And then eventually I back away and say, forget it. We're not gonna win this. Let's just get the celiac screen and the celiac screen is positive. And I feel bad that we've now, I, I now have wasted four months of, we didn't need, I don't, it, it's kind of irrelevant once you have, once you know that has somebody has a positive celiac screen or has celiac disease, what their markers look like really. Um, so it's, with, with time, I think it'll be covered at a higher, at a, at a higher rate. Thank you. Other questions or you want me to, would you like me to move on? So the next, so the next case I would say is, you know, so this is a teenager that comes in with belly pain for like six months and has been nauseous, you know, probably more nauseous in the mornings. Sometimes it impacts breakfast, but you know, then again, nobody else in the family eats breakfast either because everybody wakes up late and is rushing up out of the house. It it never gets horrible. It's not really affecting, um, it's not really affecting life. Like at least we go to like she goes to school, she does activities after school. It's not it like but it happens 
you know, weekdays, weekends, vacations. You know, she described stools being normal. Her weight, her weight and height gains look totally fine. If you press on the belly, there's a little, there's a little bit of like fullness in the left lower quadrants. And if we bring up the idea of constipation, she says, well, my stools are normal, and I tried a, I tried laxative, an over-the-counter laxative, for a few days, and it didn't help, so it can't be constipation. And I would say these are actually the, th these are the cases where like I oftentimes will double down and say, I, I mean, what do we mean by normal? Because like you know, it is a very frequent response from a teenager who does not want to talk about um, their stools that like, oh, it's normal. Like, and, and I in no way accept that as a valid answer. Um, and I really do, tor and, I, and I really do torture them with, with, with the um, options. Like we could either use the Bristol stool chart. It's been well established, you know, with the idea of constipation is usually more on the type one, type two side, you know, diarrhea is more on the six, type six or seven. It's worthwhile hashing out, like, is someone having both? Like, you know, if, if someone presents just with diarrhea, but also describes, you know, like in the morning I have diarrhea and the afternoon I have some hard stools, like that would have me again dial back to like, I think we're probably constipated with some overflow diarrhea, but really with the goal of somebody like who, who does not have, like who does not have constipation, you know, somewhere in the type three to type five range. Um, the alternative, is that I will I will offer up I, I, admittedly I don't use the Bristol stool chart because they get turned they, people get turned off by it so I instead go on to like you know just asking them rapid fire and sometimes the shock of the question is enough to have, get get a honest answer out of them like is it like rocks play doh soft serve ice cream or soup and th they almost always will give me an answer in that situation um, and I think I think that's the you know if someone's having rock like stools you know it is amazing how often people describe they're having normal stools, but it comes out like a rock. It's sometimes painful. You know, I, I think the it's typically not that hard to feel stool in the left lower quadrant. I would say like if you're feeling hard stool, like that's probably not normal. That that is probably not normal, and probably the idea of treating with a laxative um, would be a worthwhile thing, even if we have not, even if if they've tried it before. Um, you know the the value of like you get an X-ray for somebody who you're worried about constipation. I think it depends. I mean, I think you know there's studies and this, there's a couple of different studies here showing you know radiologist reproducibility of you know one radiologist thinking someone's constipated versus the next is really poor to be honest. And like th there's not a lot of value to like getting an X-ray or serial X-rays to see like oh is, like is the stool burning less? You know I would probably do it more based on physical exam and um and, and symptoms and really with and, and really with the goal of getting to like somewhere between soft serve ice cream and play-doh consistency that it's not hurting that there's no that there's never any blood that we're not having accidents and i feel like the x-rays i'll admit sometimes i get it when, when people are really doubting it and I, even if i can feel a stool burden would we'll get the x-ray to 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 be more of an illustrative fashion but i I tried to hold off on that a lot. Um, I'll admit I'm probably more likely to get an X-ray if I feel like a what I why I hope is stool. Um, but there's been a few times where I've like it's just a massive amount of stool, and I've worried like this is either like an impaction or they have a mass and uh, like a, like a tumor. And I just want to make sure that like yes, it doesn't all look like stool um, because that definitely abdominal masses can present like neuroblastoma um, certainly can present as constipation and you may feel a mass. And it, it may be a combination. It, they may have both neuroblastoma and a giant stool burden. Um, and it's, but you just don't want to miss that. So I feel like when you're feeling something massive, that's either somebody that I would do a clean out for early on and see the back pretty fast to see like, all right, things are much better or get at least get some imaging just to reassure myself. Um, you know, the clean out regimen and clearly I should say like this is totally like not FDA approved and off label suggestions, but you know, we will often do polyethylene glycol because it's easier to get it into different liquids. Um, sometimes we'll try the stack dose, like three stack doses um, over a short period of time. I, usually with the teenagers, I like using like picking a day where like we're really going to blow things out. Like, and, and that kind of avoids you know, I just envision people with like having a giant stool burden um, and then trying a little bit of a reasonable laxative dose that would be a good maintenance dose 
and then just kind of melting out the sides of a large like column of school or ball of school and then people getting frustrated because we're having diarrhea and then saying like i tried the lax it, it made things worse i had diarrhea like that's why i almost when i've seen somebody i almost always say like we're going to do a lot like you know for a teenager like for a 13 year old like i would be planning on like doing the whole like 507 gram bottle of polyethylene glycol in like 64 ounces of a beverage of their choice oftentimes it's gatorade or something of that sort um and that probably works better than like the twice a day mirror like the twice a day polyethylene glycol over the course of a week because then you get a bunch of leakage and it's like it affects school and other activities i like just making them miserable on especially for the teenagers one day give me one day you're going to poop a bunch and i bet you're going to feel better if you're having accidents the accidents may stop and it, it really does work like it is a pretty significant like undertaking but it also is a pretty like productive thing um, and they feel better and i would also say that like if you're going to bother doing a clean out then i would definitely have them on something at least for the next month because like if you just imagine like the, the rectum is totally full of stool and then we empty out like the rectum doesn't immediately like snap back into like a normal caliber it is willing to just sit there and fill back up and get back to the same place um and then they probably have to do another clean out um for the younger kids we'll use magnesium citrate which is I feel like once you're hitting around 10, not only is that 10 ounces is probably where I would max out, the taste and the fizziness tends to work against some of the teenagers. So I feel like it's the younger kids we use the magnesium citrate and the older kids we use polyethylene glycol. Um, I don't use a lot of rectal therapy. I think we've backed away on the idea of that rectal therapy is, is, is a major impact on constipation unless someone's having horrible rectal pain and just trying to get like a giant amount out the very end there's some there's some studies in kids showing that there's not after a week of either oral therapy or rectal therapy there's not a big difference except that the kids getting rectal therapy the enemas on a daily basis were less pleased with the arm that they were randomized into in those studies um and i, I feel like we use very little mineral oil just because it's it, like it's so oftentimes harder to get kids to take it and it just makes things all a little bit more viscous but doesn't really impact the like large stool burden lactulose to a lesser extent i think sometimes the taste can be a little bit limiting um but it's reasonable to use it works the same way that polyethylene glycol does and probably about the same that magnesium citrate works it's just um it's it, with the sweet taste sometimes it works against us and then this up 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 above was the study i was alluding to where like the kids, it was a reasonably randomized trial where kids got better a little bit faster if they were getting the enemas than the oral polyethylene glycol, but they were not pleased that they got the daily enemas for a week. Um, and I think it really does get it to like, if somebody just says we've tried a laxative, like how often, how long did you try it for? How, how much of an impact did we make up front? You know, I think it, uh, many kids that are constipated, like you can find a regimen with a laxative if you can get them into a good questions, thoughts on that. Hearing none, I may jump to the last. Oh, yep. This is me. I think you did a great job and there's no questions. I'm just giving you a time check that we have about 15 minutes left. Fair. Um, the last case, which is kind of near and dear to me is intended to be like a little bit less reassuring. And so this is a like a 15 year old with belly cramping and loose non-bloody schools, maybe gets a little bit worse with lactose, but has had some mild weight loss, is sometimes missing school, and like has a less benign or less innocent exam where having some right lower quadrant tenderness on, on, on exam. Um, you know, inflammatory bowel disease is also something that we don't like to miss. You know, I, I think that that is, there are definitely studies looking at you know, delays to diagnosis. And it, it, some studies, it was from Canada looking at, like looking at how long it takes kids with Crohn's disease get, to get diagnosed versus ulcerative colitis to get diagnosed. And, and and even the individual steps in like, all right, well, where's the delay from symptom onset to like diagnosis? And it really is like every single step. Like it is how long it takes them to, to complain about it, how long it takes them to get seen, seen by their primary care physician, how long it takes to refer to GI, how long it takes to actually get into the GI, how long it takes to have the colonoscopy. Like there's there's small little steps everywhere. And what probably the most important thing that they showed in, in, in the study from sick kids was that 
the kids with the longer time to diagnosis had some gro- had some growth stunting, and, and that growth stunting seemed to go on for like for up to a year post diagnosis. So like there's a little bit like I, I kind of envision there being a little bit of a cost to each delay. So it's, I always is is a GI doctor working in our inflammatory bowel disease group. I clearly have a skewed feeling on let's not miss IBD, but it, there is some potential long term consequence to missing IBD. Um, clearly. The symptoms like the bloody stools are hard to avoid, like are hard to ignore. The weight loss is hard to ignore. Crohn's disease, I feel, I feel like acts presents a little bit more insidiously than ulcer colitis, where like ulcer colitis more much more commonly is presenting with bloody diarrhea. Um, Crohn's disease doesn't certainly doesn't have to. Um, you know the subtle signs of like finger finger clubbing, some of the skin manifestations like erythema nodosum, where you get almost tiny welts or bug bites, like painful bug bites on the shin um, is worth is worthwhile to like look be looking out for. You know, the the other reason I torture kids about their stools is I want to know about rectal I want to know about rectal bleeding. And I it is definitely sometimes a a surprise when I ask about the rectal bleeding and they say, oh yeah, it's happening like a couple times a week. And the parents have no idea that that has happened. And, and it, it's definitely a question that people may not want to answer. Teenagers may not want to answer. Young adults may not want to answer. You know, I just envision it as like a teenager just wants to be normal. So they're going to try, like they're going to blow some of these things off when like rectal bleeding is not normal. Like theoretically, if we're constipated, we could have rectal bleeding. But I think like it's, it, it definitely ups the ante for like, we should really work those people out. You know, the, the, the utility of a rectal exam is definitely there. You know, we had published a study, you know, it, it actually, we looked at, the value of blood work, you know, just to look, just to screen for celiac disease, uh, sorry, for Crohn's disease. Um, and the, the blood work, a CRP, a SED rate, a CBC and an albumin probably captures about 80% of people with, with, with inflammatory bowel disease. The other missing group, what we found was that the, the rectal exam, both looking for a, like, visible, like visible blood during a rectal exam, occult blood on a glia card or any perianal disease, that increased it to nearly 95% also like so that definitely improved the sensitivity and I de- like it, it's definitely worthwhile to at the very least look at the perianal area especially if somebody's describing rectal bleeding one to look to see like all right do we see a giant fissure that's probably from your constipation or do you have skin do you have skin tags you know skin tags can happen from constipation also we usually think of skin tags happening at like the 12 o'clock and the six o'clock positions like if you're imagining somebody in, in the lithotomy position from constipation and then some of like in, in the non 12 o'clock to six o'clock positions from Crohn's disease. It, that's not a hard and fast rule. I would also say like the more complex these skin tags are, or certainly if there's a fit, if there's a fistula, um, it's worth looking at looking at the perianal area, if not at least if not doing the, the rectal exam. Um, you know, the the idea of this other screening test, you know, the IBD serology has largely been kind of backed away from um, in our group, in many groups, at least from a screen for IBD. The sensitivity is not great for looking for IBD or not. And I've definitely seen patients with like fairly frightening looking serology panels with like every antibody being positive and then a totally normal scope. So I would definitely I would definitely say like it doesn't, it's not a great screen. On the other hand, like probably the true value to it is once you know somebody has IBD, specifically Crohn's disease, it does seem like the more frightening serology panel that they have, the more likely they are to have complex disease. Um, but from at least a screening panel to look for like, hey, they have, I- they have belly pain, could they have IBD? I don't think there's much role for the IBD serology. The calprotectins, though, I do feel like has, has a huge role. Um, so this is a protein that you can actually test for in the stool that is produced largely by neutrophils, but also by a couple of other um, types of white blood cells. And the sensitivity, is best, at least the sensitivity is really good um, for inflammatory bowel disease. The specificity isn't great. So like there's a decent number of people with mildly elevated calprotectins that turn out not to have IBD. Um, but it, and this is also something that can be elevated in if somebody has like a bacterial colitis or if they have like juvenile polyps um, it also theoretically is, is elevated. Um, and, and it's actually been shown, there are a couple of different studies suggesting that if your suspicion for IBD 
is less than 65%, it is more cost effective to send the calprotectin than to do a colonoscopy. Um, I, I think it's, you know, there, that's a pretty high number. Like there's, there's not that many people that I meet in clinic, in IBD clinic, that have a, a likelihood of developing IBD, or a, a likelihood of having IBD at that time of the presentation greater than 65%. Um, so we, we send it a lot. It is not the most, it is not the cheapest of tests. Um, it probably, like most, most labs are probably charging between $100 and $200 for it. But there's value to it if you're really worried, especially if there's some weight loss. Um, so we're sending it much more regularly in our, in our referring docs. Um, in, in the Boston area are sending it more often too, just because it, it does it does help try to identify those people that, gosh, they really should be referred in a prompt way so that we avo avoid some of the growth issues with the delayed diagnosis of IBD. And I think that's all that I have. So I'm happy to talk about calprotectins. I'm happy to go back to talk about celiac disease again. I'm happy to talk about anything that you may want to chat about with the time we have remaining. All right. Well, thank you. Um, again, if you have any questions, please just um, unmute yourselves. You can come on to video. You can put it into the chat box. Otherwise, we have to stand here looking at you awkwardly for the next eight minutes. What about nausea medicine in children? Is that something that you use, Zofran, Finnegan? I'm just kind of curious because we have patients, or a lot of times parents want something for nausea for their children and that sort of thing. And I've gotten varying responses from my preceptors. Yeah, so I, I'll admit, I, I, I'll admit I, I do have some patients that I feel pressured to prescribe Zofran. I don't love it, and I feel like it's a Band-Aid. And I feel like in the setting of like somebody coming in with like acute viral gastroenteritis, I think Zofran could be an, like, that could be an amazing medication to just get them over the hump so that way they don't get dehydrated and they can stay out of the ER and, eating, and, and avoid IV fluids. Like from an ongoing thing, I feel like we admittedly probably use more periactin you know, the, or ciprohexidine that for like, not like chronic nausea cases, you know, I, I think it's, it's worthwhile thinking about like, is there something driving it? Could celiac disease be driving it? Could reflux be driving it? I, I, if, if someone's having like nausea and like painful regurgitation and heartburn, like rather than treating with Zofran, which I don't know is going to help with, for the nausea with reflux, I, I would kind of preemptively or empirically treat with either an H2 blocker or a proton pump inhibitor for two weeks and then see if there's a response. You know, admittedly for some of the teenagers with more chronic nausea, we think about like, we think about using ciproheptidine. That is a, you know, it, it was developed as an antihistamine, was not the most effective of allergy medicines, had some off target hits on like serotonin receptors to a degree also. And seems to, it certainly can be helpful. Um, and I feel like I have people on ciproheptine for longer than I would have them on like daily Zofran, where I feel like that's more of a like acute, like, all right, if we have a bad weekend, let's try to get you over the hump. So I, when I prescribe Zofran, I feel like I send it like three pills, eight pills, but with the idea that like, this is a time limited thing rather than like our new normal is gonna be, we take a Zofran every morning. Awesome, thank you. What's your recommendation for infants like who are breastfed or maybe even formula fed but are spitting up frequently or colicky or maybe have some blood in the stool? Like, do you think the cutting out milk proteins and soy? I guess what's your method? Yeah, it, yeah. So it depends. I think it depends on what your what your symptoms are. You know, for a spitty like for a kid that just like like acting like a geyser and just keeps coming out, but it's like. Happy, like if they're a happy spitter, where like they're growing fine, they're feeding fine, when they spit up, they're fine. Like there's no like there's it, it's a mess, but they're happy. I don't think you need to have any intervention other than like tincture time. That like because there's not a lot of evidence that changing the diet is going to help in those situations, or that trying it like an like an H2 blocker or a PPI is going to help in those situations. I think with rectal bleeding, I'm more likely to change the diet. That like you know in the presence or absence of like weight issues, that's kind of a side. But I think if we're seeing like visible blood in the stool, like we're going like 12 times in a day, I'd have a low threshold to take kind of milk and soy out together. Um, if we're formula fed, I would probably go to a hypoallergenic formula rather than going from like a milk-based to a soy-based because there is a high cross-reactivity between milk and soy. 
I think we probably don't do enough of challenges after the fact if we're going to do those kind of things to say, all right, like and it's the same thing with colic. Because I think we all like on this call have probably seen colicky babies that have tried like every single form and then eventually something works. And it's not necessarily that something worked. It's that this was going to this was going to burn out anyhow. Like we were going to hit our peak and then start coming down. And it's the last formula change that gets the credit when you're actually already due to start getting better. Um, I think challenging is a worthwhile thing, both with the rectal bleeding as well as with a colicky baby that like legitimately may have like an allergic proctocolitis, but like you just want to make sure that like if we're going to make a diet change for like six months, nine months, that like a, an earlier challenge a couple weeks after starting to feel better is a worthwhile thing to know that we should be still cutting these, cutting those foods out or the, or being on that particular formula. Because there's some evidence that maybe long-term cutting the, like dietary restrictions, either with mom or, or hypoallergenic formulas closer to 12 months, maybe that like helps contribute to having issues at a later age. So we kind of think now that there's this like window of tolerance sometime between six to 12 months. So even if we are convinced that someone has like, is reacting in an allergenic way, like either with blood in the stool or, or fussy feeding and colic that failed, like when the, when the food was reintroduced to mom's diet or went back to the old formula and they failed, I would still try to get back into the diet sometime between six to eight months just to see like a lot could have changed. And we at least, if there's a window of opportunity to get the food in, I think we should do it. So that way we don't potentially make more complications. Thank you. I have a, uh, like a related question. Um, uh, infants kind of changing, like, like starting solid foods. Um, yep. I'm actually using my son as an example. <laughs> um, so breastfed transitioning to solid foods, like, like bad constipation, I guess. So no, like diarrhea, blood in the stool, anything like that. Um, just kind of like, you know, actually in his case, his, his weight gain isn't that great. Um, and I think the thought is like, he's been constipated and it's affected his appetite, but I'm just wondering like beyond, you know, we, you know, we've given like apple juice and prunes and, uh, kind of like what, like the next steps kind of like beyond, um, just managing with like household stuff for constipation and a little yeah. kid. I mean, for the young kids, I will sometimes use lactulose or polyethylene glycol just in small doses. Admittedly, like it works the same way as the prune juice, the apple juice does, where like it's an osmotic effect to pull water in. Um, but sometimes it's just a matter of like there's only so much like apple juice you can give to somebody versus adding a little bit of like a little bit of the polyethylene glycol can 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 be helpful. Um, I probably don't do it in like younger than like four month old. Um, not that there's any good reason not to, but usually with the younger kids, we can kind of get by with like like some high concentrated fruit juice. But I, I I mean for others like for 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 kids starting with solid foods, it's a reasonable thing to try a little bit like poly, like a half a teaspoon of polyethylene glycol or a teaspoon of lactulose. It really does work the same way though that the, that the fruit juice and the apple juice does. Thanks. How long do you normally challenge? um for the for the reintroduction of milk and soy in infants i mean I, there are sometimes where like people go down like in flames after like one day like i would have a low threshold like i i don't think you need to purposefully suffer if like as soon as you make the change we're like all the symptoms came right back like it, it's i would say if you do it for like three to five days and we're fine, you've probably passed your challenge. But I, I would say it could be much faster if you're failing. And I think it's probably more straightforward when you're doing like formula where you can just like secretly replace one bottle for the other. And then like, I've, I've seen plenty of kids where like it's that first bottle that like, oh, it's a miserable night after one, like the hour or two after that, for, after that challenge. And then you're, then you can be done. Like, I don't think you need to do it for the full 24 hours. Um, and that's, I think that probably buys in a little bit more. You know, I think parents reasonably so are stressed out over the idea of like, they were miserable before we made this change that seemed to help. How long are we gonna need to be go back to that place? Because I don't think I can psychologically go back to that place. I would say like, we have a very short, like if we're failing after one bottle, fine. We failed, we can go back. Like 
and, and that doesn't mean that necessarily we shouldn't try to challenge at the six, eight, seven month mark. I would say that doesn't change that at all. I would still challenge at that point. Um, but I would say like, you can fail a challenge abruptly. I had one other quick question about IBD um, in terms of age range, like how early do you do you see IBD or diagnose it? I mean, you can see it in, in infancy. I mean, that's really few and far between. Like the, the, if you look at like the studies kind of describing pediatric onset IBD, it, it's an interesting, like usually it's in like the mid teens is the peak, but I think there's a little bit of a fake out because like, if you're looking at, like if you're just looking at pediatric GI groups versus adult GI groups, I actually think like the spread is more like 13 to 23 is probably where that those peak ages are. And it's just a matter of like if you're only looking at like a, a if if the adult GI groups look at their population that starts with like 18, there's gonna be a, like there's gonna be a little bit of a delay in their peak. And then in the, the, the peak of the pediatric is also gonna be a little bit farther away from 18. But if you combine them, it probably does kind of overlap with that like high school, college age um, kind of perfectly. Um, but no, I mean, we, like, we do have a handful of patients. It's, it's probably only about, you know, if you imagine 25% of IBD patients are diagnosed with kids, it's probably about 5% of kids are diagnosed under the age of like three, like out, out, out of the pediatric patients. So like, it's a pretty small fraction. Um, in that situation, it winds up being like there's a higher rate, certainly of like genetic causes for it. But for the most part, still those kids do not have a like Mendelian. I have one gene mutation or two gene mutations to cause their IBD. But that's kind of the research that we've been doing too, looking into that. But like there are some of those like very genetically driven and well-defined cases of IBD in infancy and toddlerhood. But it's very like it's it's. It's really rare and they don't necessarily, it's interesting because like the infantile onset seems to be probably remarkably severe. The toddler onset does not seem to, it, it, that seems to be pretty similar to like teenage onset. All right. Do we have any last questions as we're wrapping up? I'll pause for a minute. Okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us today, Dr. Moran, for uh, presenting. I'm going to stop recording.